I would like to introduce Dr. Idalis Vigenueva. Uh, she, is, uh, she has a PhD in chemical and biological engineering. Over the past six years, uh, she has been heavily involved in engineering education and engineering education research here at USU. Uh, as an assistant professor, her research lies in the role of learning environments and instructions, uh, the role learning environments and instructions have on student well-being and performance. Uh, she is a member of the Empowering Teaching Excellence Committee here at USU. Uh, she and I work together with uh, uh, the group that put this on, and uh, I'd like to turn the time over to her. Please, uh, if, you, if you'd like, please come closer uh, up here. Uh, Ad Adalis won't bite, I promise, and uh, uh, we'll have a good discussion here. Hello? Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you for, um, for that nice introduction. Um, I, hopefully, you have enjoyed the conference so far. Um, if you haven't, then don't blame me, even though I was part of the committee, OK? <laughs> um, so today, I'm going to talk to you guys about my experience. Um, it was a, an experience that I had last year um, for a course that I had to teach. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever tried to teach a course or a software program to someone that has never seen the program before. How many of you have tried to teach how to use a computer to your grandparents or someone like that? Right? How, how is that experience for you? I, I screw up my own frustration. <laughs> right, it, it can be a very frustrating experience. And one of the things that you realize when you try to teach a software program is that you kind of have to hold them by hand by hand, right? And you have to be there. You have to be present to help the students. Now, imagine trying to teach a software program to a group of freshman students that have never seen a program like this before. This is an engineering graphics program. And you're trying to do it in a format that's not face-to-face. -face. And so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my experiences and what happened. Um, I wanted to introduce a little bit on engineering and what's the problem with engineering, right? A lot of engineering classes tend to be very hands-on. A lot of them um, look for these practice-based experiences where you, the instructor has to be present. That's not the case in online education. Uh, while people have tried to do an online course, it hasn't been quite as effective as it could have been. And um, there are many uh, potential reasons for that, um, but it's not clear as to why um, it hasn't been effective. And I think after my experience, I probably have a little bit of a, some ideas to share, um, especially if you're thinking of taking your course in an online IVC environment. So um, just a quick overview on uh, distance education, which was specifically what I focused on. There's a higher and higher need for distance education. In fact, now we're moving from uh, teaching distance education courses that have nearly quadrupled um, over the past few years. And, and note, this is a 2007. It kind of happens every seven to 10 years where you get these types of numbers. So it quadrupled from 3 million to about 12.1 million um, from 2000 to 2007. So you can imagine and try to extrapolate that today, and we might be looking at double or triple that number. Um, so it's increasing, interestingly, in the associate level, uh, doctoral level, master's level. But if you focus on the bachelor level, it's very, very small. At the undergraduate environment, we still haven't gotten to that point where instructors feel comfortable enough to teach a distance education course, especially for those that are scientifically or technologically based. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, but just wanted to make you aware that over time, the definition of distance education has changed. And, um, Basically, the change has been to include that distance education entails uh, a percentage of time. Normally, distance education can involve instructors and students that are not in the same physical location for at least more than 50% of the time. When we refer to online education, um, this can be done in different percentages. Online education nowadays tends to happen 85% or more, just as a point of reference. So distance education can be done in different ways. Um, for example, mail, email, radio, television, 
broadcasts, videotapes, teleconferences, virtual conferences, and interactive video conferences. These are just some examples of that. An example of the broadcast is something like this, where you present um, in a remote location some video or some form of presentation of the topic that you want to give to an audience. Um, and it can be done at a later time. IVC, which is an example like here, um, you can teach a class within a classroom setting, but then also teach that class simultaneously in another location. So if you're teaching here in Logan, then you can also simultaneously teach that class in Salt Lake City, for example. So today I'm going to talk about broadcast and interactive video conferencing and some of the experiences that we've had. Um, I ended up teaching a mechanical engineering course. And that course, just to give you an idea, uh, has about 800 students enroll every year on an engineering graphics class. We have about 8 to 10 sections, 40 to 55 students per section every academic year. Uh, the problem with that is that we have no capability of increasing classroom sizes. The instructors are limited as well. So how do we do this? How do we teach the increasing enrollment numbers, increasing amount of students without causing burden on our time? And so we explored the possibility of IVC. And IVC was done um, in, one, in two ways. IVC was done here in the Logan campus. Um, what I taught in the engineering building and simultaneously uh, did an interactive video conferencing in another building, industrial science. However, we had a compounding factor, which was that we also have an affiliation with the Brigham City campus. And they were in high need of an instructor. They had no instructor for the course. They also had a need. However, a lot of their students are students that work full time, that they need to take night courses. Night teaching, um, in my case, wasn't a possibility just because of my um, restrictions and, and uh, research time. So uh, we explored the possibility of doing a broadcast in the Brigham City course as well. So um, just to give you a, a brief introduction, um, I was informed about all this two weeks before it started. And so you can imagine the panic and chaos that happened during that time. And Travis is laughing because he was part of this whole chaos. Um, Basically, they said, oh, by the way, you have to teach a broadcast class, an interactive video conferencing class in two weeks. You have to figure out how the system works. And by the way, you don't have any training on this. So I was like, oh, great, <laughs> great news. This is an exciting experience. So you can imagine that we worked very closely with City on this. Um, they rushed to get this, uh, as, as much as they could, this, this codex system that was a little bit outdated. You can imagine they, they had a sort of what, it was an 18, 1980s audio box that we used to ensure communication between the groups and so forth. Um, there was a very short turnaround time and a lot of challenges that occurred with that. So let me just show you a quick example of what would a class look like. So if I go to... Um, this video, and this is just an example of a tutorial. Okay, so today we're going over. Okay, so today we're going over. Okay, so today we're going over the tutorial on how to draw the uh, heart shape that we went over in class. So first we need to bring up our grid and click show alignment line, snap to grid, show grid, and click OK. We're going to start off by drawing this small heart. So we lock into our plane. And each of these grid lines is one inch. So we're going to count out nine because we need it to be nine inches away from the origin. And then we're going to draw the first little slant in our heart. And then to draw the uh, arc part of the heart, we're going to pull up the line and then type A on the keyboard and that will change it to an arc. And then we do the other half and click A to make it an arc. Complete the first heart. Now we need to do the second one that was also 9 inches away. And ended up finding that 
resources were kind of limited, but I found a report that was very useful. And for those of you that are interested in doing IVC or online courses, this is a really good report. This is the Hanover Research Council report. It was released in 2009, and it talks about um, the system called VOCAL, V-O-C-A-L, Visible, Organized, Compassionate, Analytical, and Leading by Example. So these are um, five steps that you can follow for any online or broadcast course. I found that to be very intuitive, very easy to follow, um, and definitely saved a lot of my time. So visible. Um, for example, if you're looking at your Canvas system, how can you find ways to make this information as textually informative as possible? Uh, especially if you're working with IVCs or broadcast courses where you are not necessarily present, it might be important to set those guidelines from day one. Organized, I, I never underestimated how organized I had to be in my syllabus to be able to manage this interactive video conferencing and broadcast at the same time. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second. Compassionate, um, using icebreaker techniques. Okay, um, because I'm in engineering, I relied heavily on a technique called the KJ technique, which I will explain in a little bit. It's a Japanese technique. It's kind of cool if you want to do it for your class. Um, analytical, use smaller but more frequent assignments. It's really helpful for that. And then leading by example. How do you model the right way to communicate to a person on, in an online environment? Yes. Better? Thank you. Okay, so if we look at the visible, for example, I, um, like uh, the other speaker was here before, he talked about the importance of saying stories. The importance of talking a little bit to the students about yourself, about the expectations, and about the resources. So in my Canvas page, I introduce the students to the course, what are the expectations, what do I expect from them, what they should expect from me, um, and then provide them resources with you know, TA office hours, syllabus, and made the course page accessible enough where they can link and cross-link a syllabus, not only in the home page, but in the syllabus tab as well. So make it as available as possible. The other thing I did was I kept it organized. So vocal, right? Visible, organized. And so um, because I understand that teacher presence is important, right? You hear it all the time. It's important that the students interact with you. It's important that you have a face-to-face -face interaction with the students. I tried to the best extent that I could at least in the Logan campus, to sort of switch back and forth between the classes. And how did I do that? I created two versions of my syllabus. And what you see in the green arrows, I established as practice session quizzes, where the quizzes would be done online through the Canvas system. And I had a moderator come in and moderate that session for me. On the other hand, that same week, I flipped the order of the lecture so that if one classroom had the quiz, the other classroom would have lecture. And so it, would, it allowed me the opportunity to switch between classes and at least meet the students, not as often as I'd like to, but at least something. The other thing I did was um, I was very conscious of letting both classrooms know that they are part of one big classroom. That just because they are separate classrooms doesn't mean they're separate sections. And so in the final project, I uh, got an auditorium, a big auditorium, had all the students come together um, and see the final presentations that I had for this class. Compassionate. Compassionate was a method that I used to help students uh, break the ice, not only in my sections, um, but uh, with myself. And so I used a technique called the KJ technique. Has anyone heard of the KJ technique? No? So the KJ technique is a Japanese technique. And the way it works is you have posted notes. And you have students provide an idea of a topic that you present. You know, so for example, if you say, what is the best approach to X problem? You have students write their ideas in posted notes. All of them do it in silence. And they post their notes next to each other. And you have a group of students that come together, look at the notes, 
and then silently start putting in order the notes. Doesn't matter who wrote the idea, the idea is that they prioritize the notes based on, on that. And then at the end of that session, once they prioritize the ideas, they openly discuss the order and the priority of those ideas. So it's an opportunity for them to talk about their ideas, really consider each other's perspectives, and um, break the ice for a classroom. The other thing was that um, the analytical, so vocal, visible, organized, compassionate, analytical. Um, simple things like telling the students in IVC or broadcast, how do you want the assignment or the quiz to be labeled? A simple thing like that will make a huge difference, especially if you're trying to keep track of classrooms. Um, I used A numbers for that. Um, it really helped me keep track of the students um, and the section number to differentiate what class I was teaching. I also did presentations. Presentations, I couldn't do it as I would have liked to in a face-to-face -face environment, so I gave them a lot of take-home quizzes and counted them as participation points to make sure that everyone did contribute to the class. And then the final one was leading by example. Um, there are many ways for people to communicate in person and online. And one of the things I wanted to emphasize to my groups was it doesn't matter if you're physically in Logan or if you're not physically in Logan, you still all have to communicate. So I presented them with a case study. This is a case study from the 21st century skills. And basically, if you're interested in, in that, you can find this in p21.org. Um, and it's a list of the most important competencies that employers are looking for in students um, as soon as they graduate. And I bring up this, these first two a lot oral communication and teamwork. You know, I do emphasize the importance of technical knowledge, but I also bring, hey, you need to talk about your communication skills. Let's talk about best strategies. And so in my classes, I gave them tutorials and resources to proper online communi uh, oral communication. Um, so there were some pros and cons. Uh, again, I, I was thrown into this last week kind of you know, into the wolves type of situation, but I survived. I'm still here, and that's good. Um, so some, some pros that I had was that the codex system that was installed was pretty functional, um, and there were recordings that were established to ensure that the broadcast course would receive a recording of my lecture, so that went well. But I experienced a lot of resistance from the students, okay? And it, in part, it, it had to do with that two-week period. Had they known a semester in advance the type of course that they would have been exposed to, I think a lot of these situations would have been mitigated. Um, at the time, uh, the scheduler uh, had some resistance themselves on informing students on the format of the class. Now this is something that's changing. They have to let students know in advance about that. Um, so between Logan and Brigham City, okay, some of the pros, uh, the recordings were helpful to the students. A lot of them said and indicated that it was very useful to go back to the lectures at their leisure, at their time, and use it to study for assignments. Um, but it also had a disadvantage whenever um, they requested tutorial videos for those softwares, especially when it required TAs. Um, TA training was a big challenge. A lot of the students were uh, overwhelmed at using the system. So in retrospect, having the TAs be part of that training uh, in advance would be really important. So just to give you an idea of uh, what happened, these are the three sections. The one in Logan, there was one classroom that was able to receive and broadcast classes back and forth. One classroom that only received the uh, lectures and, w and the Brigham City section. And I didn't find any real changes in their overall scores. They all performed the same. Now I'm not afraid of showing this, so you know, here, here it goes. Here are my evaluations, okay? And so I'm not gonna highlight too much of it, but I wanna show you these last two columns. So this was the classroom in Logan that received and broadcast. This was the classroom in Logan that received only. This was the classroom in Brigham City that was broadcast. And so we see that receiving and broadcast, 50, 44, 52, 44. 
about the same. But when I look at the receiving only class, the evaluations were much lower, 44, 36. Um, again, these two sections, like I said in the syllabus, I had done my biggest effort to try to see them. And I was able to see them both in the same amount of time. So what this tells me is that there's some sort of weird psychological thing going on with the students, right? That even though they know that the class is an IVC class, the fact that they know I'm in campus sort of set them on this path of uh, saying, well, you know, I'm not having really the same advantages as someone else that has more of my face-to-face -face time. So it really talks about teaching presence. Um, so in the future, and, and this is something that I'm going to be doing this semester, we finally fixed the codex so that both classrooms can receive and broadcast, and so I'm going to do more of a conscious effort to be in both classes as much as I can. But it's just interesting to me. And then the, the Brigham City students, I guess they're a little bit more used to these types of formats, so it, it didn't really face them to have a broadcast class. Um, so just uh, to wrap up, uh, there were a lot of pros. I have to say, I really did enjoy the IVC broadcast experience because it really did reduce my teaching time. So I could have easily done three back-to-back -back sessions teaching 150 students, but I was able to reduce it to one or two sessions. So the teaching time is reduced. There is, however, a lot more um, prep time initially because of the creation of the tutorial videos, the training of the TAs. But what I found was that if I did that within the first month and really drilled in that concept of doing the tutorials, training them how to use the codex system, eventually it sort of phased out. Um, so I didn't have any other problems with that. Uh, group projects was a little bit more challenging um, when considering IVC formats. Um, not because of the differences in the sections, but just because the backgrounds and the times of the students. So Brigham City students work full time. You know, I had to do different considerations against others in the Logan campus. Um, so just some recommendations. If you're thinking of doing an IVC or broadcast course, negotiate teaching time. I, I wish I would have had one semester to really prepare and understand what were the pros and cons of doing online education, distance education, excuse me, um, and, and really choose my TAs carefully, right? I wish I would have had a little bit more time to interview them, to see how comfortable they were with a broadcast, with a IVC format, um, give them training time. So, so definitely request that time. One thing I did in my sections, I had an observer come to the class, make sure that what I was teaching was effectively understood and I had that observer give me comments and feedback throughout the semester. The other thing I did was I provided a, what I call an emotional support. I had an informal TA, graduate student, that sat in the back of the class, didn't really participate in the class, but ever so often would come to the students and say, hey, how are you feeling about the class? You know, what do you think? And, and you know, just having someone that really wasn't tied into me per se, but it was just someone that seemed to be part of the classroom, really allowed the students to open up and talk to them about the challenges with the class, gave me an opportunity to try to readjust and give them, uh, uh, address the situations that I could. So if you can have some informal observer, that would be great. City, city, city. I mean, I can't emphasize it so much. It's, they were invaluable. I, there's no way, I mean, I, we owe you guys so much. The, the fact that this course was pretty good, we definitely seek their help. It's really important. Um, look at the literature. That Hanover report was really succinct, very helpful when um, it came to doing this class. And be willing to modify and reflect on your own teaching. You know, be open to knowing this isn't going to be a, a walk in the park. This is something that is going to take time and reflection for that. So. Um, instructor overload, definitely. Uh, was it a rewarding experience? Yes. You know, in the end, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about what I can and cannot do. And I learned that um, when you do IVC and broadcast courses, your mindset as a teacher changes for the better. 
I think. Now you're thinking not just about the people you see in front of you, you're thinking more globally. And that alone is a very powerful experience. So um, thank you guys for your time. If you want to talk to me a little bit more about my experiences, here's my information. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Absolutely not. I had, so that, that was really a great resource. Oh, the Hanover report? No, the, no. Just as being a student in a Uh-huh. Um, I was Oh, so putting yourself in their shoes is really helpful. Yes, yes. It, and I saw that interaction when I went to visit the Brigham City students, how different it was. I, I did get to observe. I snuck in about half an hour before just to see how it worked. So thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>